Welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith and look what is on the table today. It's Chronicles of Dronagor Age of Darkness from Creative Game Studios. Now this is a game that was on my most anticipated list for 2021. Very excited to finally be getting this thing to the table and the focus around this video is going to be solely on this start here guide which you'll find on the inside of just the core box itself. This guide is an open and play guide is going to help you to set up and start your adventure, your single player adventure, while also learning the rules as you go. The one thing to note here is this is not the entirety of the rule set, it's just going to be the rules you need to know to get the flow of the game and to get into the action. Now, just before we head into that action, I want to talk to you about something pretty exciting, and that is the demo box for the Apocalypse expansion, which is definitely a big-time expansion coming in the upcoming campaign for Chronicles of Dronagor, and that is in the very near future. All the information around that one and the links you can find in the video description and pinned comment. I will be putting together an overview video of this Apocalypse box to give you an idea, especially those of you that have already completed Chronicles of Dronagor and I Idea as to what you're going to find inside of this thing. But without further ado, let's head back to the core experience and learn a little bit more about how this game operates. So back at the start here guide, it does state right in here, the point of this is to get you into the world of Dronagor and teach you all the basic game rules. And it's built for approximately a half an hour of play and it features the first chapter, Missing from Black River in a playthrough style. Now, as you go through this guide, it will highlight areas of the rulebook you can read for additional layers of understanding of how this game operates, but you don't need to. You can just flow strictly through this booklet and that is going to be the idea behind this video to give you a visualization of this particular booklet if you don't even want to play it or you can't because you don't have the game in hand you'll at least get enough of an idea as to how this thing flows through this experience so as it states right here it says to unpack your hero as the very first step to learn the first steps of Chronicles of Dronagor, you need to choose a hero to represent you in the campaign, and the guide wants you to specifically use the dwarf warrior Vorn. And this dwarf, you are going to need to grab a number of things to get it set up. Now, if you have the game trays dashboards for the characters, you can use them. If you don't, then you'll be using a little bit different of a setup. You won't have that black game tray underneath of it, but you definitely need Vorn's dashboard. You're going to need the health tracker. You'll also need Vorn's miniature, initiative card, and any starting gear. Now you'll see starting gear is a small keyword under the title of each item. In this case for Vorn, that's going to be the plate armor and the jagged blade axe. Step number two is to take your action cubes. In this game, the management of actions that your hero can perform is based on a system of rotation of cubes. During each turn, you'll be able to use up to two of these cubes, allocating them in spaces indicated for your skills, and then carry out the effects. The amount of action cubes that a character starts the game with, as well as their respective colors, are described on their initiative card. So the initiative card that we pulled for Vorn right here lets us know we need to grab two yellow, red, Red, green and a blue. Just like that we've got the cubes we need and we can move to step number three which is about preparing our hero so our hero's primary actions are shown on the hero board. Here you'll find the information you need to manage your hero throughout the game. At this point, we're going to place our action cubes and our starting gear into their respective positions on the board. Just like that, Vorn has been all set up. He's got his available action cubes in the available action cube space right on the character's artwork. We also have the jagged blade axe. Icons on the card match the icon for the slot so you know which one it goes in. Same for the plate mail armor here. And the last thing we need to do is set our health. You'll see the health bar across the top one of those numbers is shaded just a bit darker and that is the starting health for the characters we'll slide this down to 12. The next step is to choose your dungeon role. The dungeon role you choose for your hero gives you access to four skills designed to help you fulfill your role in the party. There are five dungeon roles to choose from. A controller, Defender, and you can see Defender is exactly who Vorn is going to be. Leader, Striker, and Support. Now for this tutorial, we have to go with the Defender ones if we want things to line up. So at this point, we're now going to go ahead and place them next to our hero board. 
Just like that, we have our dungeon roll cards slotted in, Defender 1 and Defender 2. You're going to notice something about Defender 1. It has a P on the card for passive. This passive ability called Toughness gives Vorn plus three maximum health, so we get to raise Vorn's health up by three, bringing him to 15. The next step is all about the initiative track to manage the order of turns during a round. You use the initiative track. It is essentially a ruler that watches over the order in which all characters involved in the game take turns. To indicate your hero's turn, you place the initiative card on the initiative track. So we place Vorn right in the defender position. A round always begins with the card that occupies the highest slot on the initiative track, and as soon as all of their respective characters finish their turn, they must move the turn marker to the next card on the track. So we've gone ahead and placed the turn marker token right on Vorn. When all characters have completed their turn, the round ends in a new round, returning the marker to the first character begins. Let's shift our focus from the character over to preparing the board setup, which is the next step. Now, adventures are played through a succession of rooms and doors that your hero is going to go through facing monsters, executing interactions, and claiming treasures, of course. Now, every adventure will start with a preparation called the first step, where the adventure will take place. With each new door you open from then on in, a new setup will be added to the existing one, and thus, a new path of exploration will be formed until the hero is able to fulfill the objectives announced by the adventure. The game relies heavily on game trays. There'll be a number of them inside the core box of varying sizes and shapes and tiles of varying sizes and shapes. The guide will specifically let you know which tiles to place in for this particular first experience and you'll see there's an easy reference in the bottom right hand corner to find the right one. As depicted inside the guide, you're going to also need to find door 01 and slot that in to the side of the game tray. And again, this is going to be one of the ways in which you move to the next room in succession as you go through your adventure. As an example, I've gone ahead and summoned the Skeleton Archer for playing a solo adventure like I'm currently doing right now. So that means just one Skeleton Archer is going in the one position right here. And you can see it is above a dividing line, which then breaks out even more that could be part of this particular room if there were additional characters in play. So it will scale and will throw more at you in particular rooms based and the number of characters under your control. Now, the next thing to mention is that heroes, as you can see here, can actually spawn in on a number of different locations at times. For this particular setup, though, it's telling us to go ahead and place our hero Vorn in the bottom right-hand corner. So Vorn has now entered the room in the bottom right hand corner and just to hammer home what I was talking about in terms of its scaling based on the number of characters, say for instance I had Vorn and one other additional hero, then at this point in time I'd be placing an additional skeleton archer as depicted by the setup in this position right here. But again, we're playing solo so it's just the one. We also, as you might have noticed, put a yellow base on the bottom of the skeleton archer. We also grabbed an initiative card and a a yellow cube. So with a yellow base attached to our skeleton archer, a yellow cube, and we're going to be using the yellow row from the monster health board, we're going to be able to track that monster's health specifically. So we'll take a look at the skeleton archer card here, and it has a six in terms of its health. So we'll place this cube on the six position. It's important to mention that you have the Skeleton Archer with the Rookie keyword facing up and not the opposite side, which is actually more difficult. With the health of the Skeleton Archer now set, we take a look at our initiative track. And as you can see here, we know we put Vorn as a defender right at the very beginning of the track. And if you take a look across, we've got support, leader, different dungeon roles for other characters that could be involved. But in this case, we now have an enemy. And we're going to take a look at runes. And rune here for the Skeleton Archer, this one is a green rune, which is this one right here, which means that's exactly where the Skeleton Archer will sit. As long as the Skeleton an archer is alive every time the marker reaches its card it will be the skeleton archer's turn to act if it dies and it is the last of the skeleton archers you just remove the card from the initiative track 
Now that's going to do it for this setup. We are now ready to begin our very first hero turn. However, there's a couple things, maybe a few things that you probably should have at the table and within easy reach to make this tutorial process even easier. The first thing is find all of these ruins. There's going to be nine of each of them. You're going to mix them all together and fire them into this bag right here. We will be drawing from them. They are going to tell us which darkness tile, the shape of which is coming from this tray right here. So keep that darkness tray within easy reach as well. The room bag is all set up. We also have these darkness tiles within easy reach and you also want to grab a D20 and keep that next to your character as well. Last but certainly not least, you're going to want to keep all the tokens within easy reach. Again, everything's inside of a game tray, keeping things nice and organized. There's even color coordination going on there. So if you need to find a particular token, it's going to be a lot easier all laid out. And now we get to the fun stuff. We get to begin our very first hero turn. It's worth mentioning on a hero turn, you can move up to three spaces, both orthogonal and diagonal movement is allowed, and you use up to two action cubes to take some actions. Now the very first thing we're gonna do as a move action is we're gonna move Vorn to an indicated position three spaces away. Now, Vorn is a melee-focused hero. Of course, he's got an axe, and therefore, he's not yet within reach to use his main skills. So to get a little closer to his opponent, Vorn is going to use the skill Bull Rush. In order to use a skill, Vorn will need to use a cube of the color associated with that skill. So Bull Rush is a green skill, which is an agility skill. So at this point in time, we're gonna take a green cube and we're gonna place it in Bull Rush. Now we're mainly using Bull Rush for the movement, but we also get additional damage. So Vorn now with the additional movement was easily able to move from his current position one additional space to be right up against the skeleton archer. It's worth mentioning that the cube that was used by Vorn to execute the bull rush is going to remain in that skill until it's recovered through a recall action. We'll talk more about that later on down the line. Vorn is still able to execute one more cube action this turn as well, because remember, we're able to do two cube actions a turn. Now what's pretty awesome about the bull rush, as you likely notice, is it states up to two target adjacent enemies take two damage. Now in this case there's only one, but that one enemy still takes two damage, so two damage is going to knock the Skeleton Archer from six down to four. So knowing that we've already done our move action, we've already spent one of our action cues, we still have the availability to spend one more cube. And now that we're right up against the Skeleton Archer, we might as well finish it off. So let's go ahead and grab a yellow cube here. And we're gonna go ahead and do an arcing swing. Now, just before we go ahead and actually take this action, I wanna talk quickly about melee, which is yellow skills, which can only target enemies that are adjacent to a hero, which is why we chose that one, while ranged, which are red skills, can target enemies that are within an area a blue square away. So as you can see on our current room tile here, we've got a bunch of blue squares all over the place, but they encompass a number of other squares. So basically how ranged works is if, say for instance, since the Skeleton Archer had range 1, then it would be able to target any hero that's in this square here, this square here, or this square here, no matter where they are within that blue square. And just before we go ahead and resolve our yellow selection here, want to talk about some icons you're also seeing next to them. These cross swords basically mean it's a weapon attack. So you're definitely going to want to be referencing your weapon when you make that attack. And then you'll also see some other icons around here. This one here, which appears twice here on Vorn's board, is for spell attacks. And we'll talk more about the lightning bolt a little later on. Now the key thing to know around weapon attacks is that they tend to inflict more damage, however they require an attack roll of the d20 to be successful, whereas spell attacks always hit their target but they tend to inflict less damage. So you're going to have to make some choices strategically there. So I've gone ahead, I've chosen Arcing Swing, and it's a melee attack. It's got a Cleave 2. We're going to leave the Cleave 2 out of it for now. We'll talk more about that later on. For the plus 3 hit, though, that is definitely important because, as you know, I just mentioned, if you're doing a melee attack, you are using a weapon, 
And if you're using a weapon, you have an accuracy rating on that left-hand side there. In this case, it's seven, which means we are rolling the D20 and trying to hit the seven or be above it. And we have a plus three to hit going into it, which means when we roll this die, we get to add three to it, giving us pretty good chances of being at seven or over. So here we go. Hopefully I don't uh, actually jinx that. We got ourselves five. Oh my gosh. And then plus three is eight. So yes. We just barely scrape by, but this is going to land. The attack does damage. How much damage? You take a look in the bottom right-hand corner of the axe. It tells us three damage is heading to the Skeleton Archer. Skeleton Archer is currently at four, dropping it down to one. It is still standing, however. So unfortunately, we weren't able to take out the Skeleton Archer on our turn. We've already done our move action. We've also spent two action cubes. So our turn at this point is over. We take the turn order marker and we move it to the next individual in line. And that's going to be the Skeleton Archer, which now moves us into when monsters attack. Monsters in this game have an AI that guides their behavior and their philosophy behind a monster's turn is to always try to attack as many heroes as it can. Now, monsters will always move before attacking if needed. They cannot attack and then move, however. Monsters do not need to make an attack roll. They always hit the heroes. It's up to the heroes to find ways to avoid or defend themselves from the monster's attack. Both heroes and monsters cannot perform Form range attacks while adjacent to an enemy being considered to be engaged in combat it's not allowed you can find a lot more details around the engagement within the rule book but those are the basics now taking a look at the skeleton archer rookie card there is a movement of four on it so he will move away from vorn the minimum amount he can in order to get within range after movement and attack him because as i just said a ranged attack cannot be adjacent so the Skeleton Archer will go ahead and use one of its movement to move here, but is still adjacent. So another one will be spent to bring it to here. Now, similar to looking at the weapons that Vorn was carrying, the Skeleton Archer also has icons and information around what it will do and how it will act. You'll see in this particular case, range one, multi-shot two, and poison one. We know it will do three damage when it hits, and it has up to four movement. It shows the range icon here as well, and of course, its health on the right, as well as the rune that it is tied to. So for range one, we already understand that, and it's already put itself in position to be able to do a range one attack right now. Multi-shot two basically just means if there happen to be two heroes in play, it would attempt to try and make attacks on both of them. Again, one of the monster rules is that it will try to attack as many of the individual heroes as it possibly can, and there's a poison one there as well. Poison is a condition that will be inflicted as a side effect if the Skeleton Archer's attack managed to cause at least one damage to Vorn. It's important to note when a hero is threatened with damage, he can try or she can try to defend him or herself if possible through reactions. So let's talk about those. So in addition to attacking, a hero also has defensive abilities and you can use them in some cases, even on a monster's turn in response to their attacks. These skills are called reactions and they are indicated by the symbol, which looks like a lightning bolt. Now I passed over this before because it makes a lot more sense now to bring this around. You can see there's a lightning bolt here for divert, which is prevent three. We have a lightning bolt over here on the plate armor, which is endure, allows us to self and prevent three. So we have options here in terms of trying to avoid what we know is three damage that could potentially come from the skeleton archer. So knowing that three damage is coming from the skeleton archer, definitely using a red cube from my available cubes here in order to place in the plate armor slot to activate the ability to have a self prevent three, which blocks all of that damage is also worth mentioning. You'll see four different colors on the card. It means I could use any of those colors to activate that ability. With the attack blocked, the Skeleton Archer's turn is over and the turn order marker returns back to Vorn. Moving into the second round, I'm going to go ahead and have Vorn move diagonally to be adjacent to the Skeleton Archer. 
And in an effort to wipe this skeleton archer out without any issues whatsoever or the need for die rolling, which could potentially result in a failed attack, I'm going to go with a spell attack to guarantee some damage. So taking a look down here at the Whirlwind of Steel, which is a spell attack, it says self, shield two. That's going to be pretty handy. We'll talk about that in a second. And then up to two target adjacent enemies take one damage each. Well, that's exactly what I need. So I'm going to use this blue cube right here and we're going to populate this ability. Forn has given himself two shield tokens. These are really going to come in handy. We'll talk more about them later on. But first, let's place that one damage and wipe out the skeleton archer. That final hit will resolve the archer so the archer can now be removed from the game board. It's also worth mentioning that Vorn is going to lose any movement points he hasn't used this turn right after activating his skill. So remember, I did a move action, which I only moved one space, and typically I can move up to three. However, I chose to go ahead and activate an ability, which then cuts off any free available movement that I have left over. We are now ready to open up the doors. Now keep in mind, when you open a door, a few things have to happen. First, to open a door, a hero must be adjacent to it and use the minor action, open a door. And there's a bunch about this in the rule book. Now when it's opened, a door will present a new setup that should be added to the existing one. And I'll show you exactly what's inside this door in a few seconds when we open it. The yellow arrow is where the connection to the previous map door happens. So Basically, when we open up this particular door, we're going to see a layout of how to set up the next room. And it's also going to show with a yellow arrow where it connects to the current room. On the left hand side, you're going to see some narrative text, which we'll read in a second. You're also going to see that setup right in the middle. You'll see the yellow arrow at the very, very bottom there, letting you know that's the connection point to the current room, as we mentioned. It's also going to tell you every single map tile and tray you need to get in order to get set up, plus anything that needs to be placed. Again, taking a look down below based on the player count. There's also special rules that may come into play, so be mindful of those as well. The old house. Through the shattered shutters of a humble cottage, you see a woman screaming desperately for help as more monstrosities creep closer. In her arms, she holds a bawling child, a knife fluttering at her throat. Stay back, she screams. You will not turn us into your damn creatures. You slosh through a puddle, drawing the attention of the creatures. Some turn to halt your advance while a black hooded figure continues toward the cottage. There is no time to waste. Now let's turn our attention over to the initiative track where things are going to change. Now first off, when I killed off the skeleton archer when the room was just a single one, this initiative card should have come out of here and been gone. But don't worry, it's coming back anyway because immediately after opening up the door, we have a skeleton archer on the other side which puts this card right back where it was. It is a skeleton archer rookie card. But a new one that we have coming in here is the cultist card. The Shadow Cultist is now in play and you can see it also brings in an extension to the initiative track which now ensures that the Shadow Cultist rune matches as it does here now and everything is set up still. We're still with Vorn having the turn order marker but that new entry is something we need to focus on plus we need to take a look at the health for the Shadow Cultist as well as the Skeleton Archer and make sure we update the health board for the monsters. The Skeleton Archer is going to be at 6 health as a rookie, and the Shadow Cultist as a veteran is at 10 and has a blue base. Let's take a quick look at the special rules that showed up after we went through door number one. The first one here is around the Shadow Cultist, the veteran. It spawns darkness at the beginning of each of its activations. Before it takes any other action, you must draw one rune and place the matching darkness tile spawning from the Shadow Cultist and heading towards the heroes adjacent to another tile on the map if the Cultist is already on a darkness tile when this effect occurs. Special rule number two states, when the last monster is defeated and you have interacted with the interaction token, read end of the adventure, return to camp on page five. So with everything now set up for these new rooms, we're still within Vorn's turn as I've only spent one of my action cubes, so I still have one available left. However, it's only a yellow one, and at this point in time, I don't have anybody nearby to me that I can do a melee attack with. So we are going to end Vorn's turn here, moving it to the Skeleton Archer. 
The Skeleton Archer is going to try to get within range in order to make an attack. And as we know, it has a range of one, which means it needs to be, the hero, one blue square away in order to make an attack. So this Archer really needs to get a lot closer to make that happen. So for right now, it's going to beeline it towards me to get as close as it possibly can. So it's going to be going four spaces. The final movement point placed the Skeleton Archer inside of this water area. And there is a note here that it's a minus one move, which means if we had any additional movement left to spend, we would lose one of them. But in this case, because our fourth movement point put us into the water, we don't lose anything and that movement is over. Plus the benefit is with a range one for the Skeleton Archer, it cannot target our hero. The Skeleton Archer's turn is done. We now move for the first time to the Shadow Cultist. As soon as the turn begins, for the Shadow Cultist based on the special rules that we read inside of door number one there in the bottom left hand corner. It states we need to place some darkness, so let's talk about darkness. Darkness is a force which is still poorly understood by the heroes, but a good part of its mysteries are going to be revealed throughout the campaign. However, some of its effects are immediately noticeable, as well as its undeniable desire to consume everything that is alive, causing despair and destruction to everything that stands in its way. Now, to invoke darkness, you're going to follow the special rule for this particular scenario, 01, and it states that as soon as the initiative token reaches the Shadow Cultist, we must go ahead and draw a rune from the bag, find its matching darkness tile, and place it on the board. This is the darkness spawning. So we're going to grab the rune bag now, we're going to give it a good shuffle, we're going to dig inside of this thing, and we're going to find a rune, and pulling it out, we're going to also flip it over to its back side, and on the back side of the rune that we pull out, it will tell us the shape of the darkness we need to grab from this tray. I've gone ahead and pulled the darkness tile that matches the back of the rune. Now this rune matches this one right here, so this is where we place it. Now, the darkness will try to reach the strongest hero that currently does not already stand on darkness maps or tiles. This is how the darkness behaves. Now, darkness has two types of effect, one of which is passive, and you will always be subjected to it as long as you stay adjacent to or on top of it, and one which is triggered whenever a hero fulfills its criteria. Now, normally you can only suffer damage from darkness one once per turn, which can occur more than once per round. So that's definitely interesting to note. And the effects of darkness are at length and detailed out inside the rulebook. But for the purposes of this start guide, we're going to move right into placing the darkness and talk more about its effects a little later on. Now in this round, the darkness will not be able to reach Vorn, of course, quite far away. And its shape also happens to fit on the map. There are rules specific to whenever darkness doesn't fit on the map, and those are detailed in the rulebook, but we'll be talking about those later on as well. With the special rule now satisfied that came from door number one, the booklet that has two special rules on it, we can now move into the Shadow Cultist's turn and complete the rest of it. And the Shadow Cultist really wants to try and go up against Vorn. The Cultist has a total movement of four and will be using all of it to get within range two of Vorn. So the Cultist had four movement, moved from this location here for one, another one for two, another one for three, and because it moved into water, similar to how the Skeleton Archer did, but this time the Shadow Cultist actually has one additional point of movement to lose, it will be losing that point of movement. Now, despite having its movement reduced by the water terrain, the Shadow Cultist will still be able to reach Vorn due to its range two. It's also worth noting, and you're probably wondering, why did it move in this fashion? Why did it go down over the edge and then go on a diagonal rather than straight across? Well, monsters will always try to move in the most intelligent way possible, seeking advantageous positions and always being close to darkness to receive its benefits. And there are benefits that you're going to see because as of right now, the actual cultist is adjacent to a space of darkness. The Cultist at this point is going to make an attack against Vorn, and you can see range 2 definitely within range. It's multi-shot, which won't matter because there is only one hero, and it has a curse of 1. Now, the important thing to note here is the damage. It is 5 damage coming our way, and additional damage is added on top of it because the Cultist is adjacent to darkness for a total of 6. With six damage coming through, thankfully these two shields will be spent in order to block two of it, and if you ever have shield tokens, you must use them before reducing your health. So that drops it down to four, and the rest of that damage is going to come through, dropping us from 15 down to 11. 
In regards to using shield tokens, it's also important to mention that, that you even have to use them before you choose to use a reaction to prevent damage as Vorn did earlier. It's important to note that I did have the availability to use an action cube and use a reaction in order to prevent some of the damage on my defender card here. You can see I could use this one right here with the lightning bolt to prevent three with any color, which means the yellow would work there. But for the purposes of this example, I'm choosing to just go ahead and take that damage damage. Now, not only did we get hit physically for some damage, we also got Curse 1. And as it states in the rulebook, a curse is going to give you one of these black cubes, which you then need to place in one of your abilities. This is going to block up that ability and not allow you to use it going forward. Vorn is going to choose to block his skill first aid with the curse cubes. You can see I placed a black one right in here, so we cannot use that. And now with the Shadow Cultist attack resolved, the second round is ending. The initiative marker returns to Vorn's card, making the start of the third round occur right now. Now moving into the third round, our focus is going to be on interactions. And in order to interact with something, we need to be close to it. And so that clue token in the top right-hand corner, we're going to beeline it there as fast as we can. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and perform perform our regular move into the water. Now, many of you will likely have noticed this. There is a misprint in the original start here guide, and that comes into play when Vorn here moves into water. So as we've already learned, when you move into water, it's a minus one for this particular tile. So if he goes into the water with three movements, spending one to get in there, he's got two remaining, and one of them gets lost, which means he can then only move one more space. So technically, he should actually be right here. But for the purposes of following the start here guide verbatim in terms of the flow of learning, we're going to place our character here, which is how it's depicted. I just want to make this note, is it something I caught as I went through it? Now at this point, I've expended all of my move action movement points, but we can generate more movement by using action cubes, because remember we can use up to two action cubes on our turn, and I do still have that yellow one. So what I'm going to do is spend this, and it states right here, as an action, you may expend one AC to move three. This is going to allow Vorn to move over here diagonally one, up two, and then to the top layer here for three. Just like that, we are on the very top, and the one thing you probably notice is we are now completely out of action cubes, and we still technically are able to spend one, so this is where a recall action is now triggered. So let's talk about a recall action. There are two ways to perform a recall action based on whether you do it willingly, thus we have the willing recall action, and the unwilling recall action. Now in this case, because we've run out of cubes, we are going down the road of the unwilling recall action and by doing so, he's able to recover all of his action cubes that were allocated to a skill or moved to the expended cube box. Now, Vorn has chosen to block his bull rush skill with the curse cube he received due to taking of a recall action. So as you can see, all the cubes have returned to the center, but because this was an unwilling recall action, we had to place a black cube in one of the ability slots. So as I mentioned, we chose the bull rush. So we've completely locked out our green section here. For the final action cube spend, he's going to place his green one down here in order to gain three movement. Vorn doesn't need all three movement to get adjacent to this particular token. Two will do, so one and two. At this point, Vorn is now adjacent to the interaction point, and with a minor action, he can interact with it, and he will, and resolve its effects in a second. However, something else has happened here. While he was moving to that interaction point, he stepped on Darkness Tile and has to suffer the consequences for that. Now the rules will go into detail around how this operates, but the short version states that the hero stepping on a darkness map or tile for the first time in a turn will take two damage. And this damage can be prevented by shield tokens or preventative skills. But for this example, Vorn is gonna accept to just to receive the damage, knocking him from 11 down to nine. So just to reiterate, this damage can only be taken once per turn. So if a hero steps two or three times over darkness in the same turn, he's only going to take damage once. And this damage can be repeated throughout the round since a round is made up of turns of different characters. Now this is the same rule that is applied to the suffering of the effects of a terrain too. 
So let's talk quickly about interactions and what they're all about. Now, interactions are scenes that are taking place in that room that your character can interfere with and the consequences as well as the rewards of an interaction vary according to the option chosen. So interacting with an interaction point is considered a minor action and thus each hero can perform one interaction in each of their turns. Every interaction point is accompanied by an illustration, as you can see here, containing options indicated by a numeric entry. The illustrations for each interaction are presented in the interactions book on the page described in the setup. Now, in this case, it's right inside the start here guide. You can find details about interactions on a specific page within the rulebook. I'll leave that for you to find more details. The resolutions for each of these entries are available in the adventure book in the last chapter, organized in numerical order. How However, the resolutions for the Start Here guide are right here in this booklet. So after we choose and read the entry described, Vorn's turn will have ended since he's already used his move action and his two cube actions to acquire new move actions. In this situation, we have take the knife from her hand, take them to Black River Village, try and calm her to obtain more information, or try to talk to the girl. And I'm actually going to try and talk to the girl, which is 36. The woman sees you moving toward her without weapons raised and throws the knife in her hand to a corner while she hugs her daughter close and sobs. We need to go to a safe place, she says. The woman stands up and starts to prepare a shoulder bag with some things for the journey. She asks you to keep an eye on the child. Not knowing what to do, you kneel down and try to talk to the girl who slowly stops crying. You see she is holding something tight in her hands and when you ask her about it, she shows you an amulet. It protects me from the darkness. Take it. It will protect you too. At this point, the book states to write down the amulet of light status on our campaign log and whenever we want during our turn as a minor action, you can destroy up to two darkness tiles on the board. Erase this status from your campaign log after you perform the action. And there's a whole bunch more information around how the campaign log works in the rule book. With Vorn now resolving the interaction, his turn now comes to an end. The initiative marker has been moved from him and will go to the skeleton archer rookie to take a turn. At this point, we're going to be doing some movement with the archer as it tries to get in range to make an attack. The Skeleton Archer has a total of four movement to use. It's going to try to get within range and stop there. It's also going to be smart enough to try and take advantage of the darkness as well and become adjacent to it. So we're going to have the archer go up for one, two, three, and it will stop right here where it is adjacent to darkness as well as within one range diagonally to where our hero currently resides. So three damage coming from the Skeleton Archer, plus one for the Darkness is a total of four, knocking me down from nine to five. I don't like the idea of that, so let's go ahead and spend one cube as a reaction here to use our plate armor to prevent three of it, so only one gets through, dropping us from nine down to eight. Now it's worth mentioning that there was a poison one on the Skeleton Archer, and because one point of damage did make it through, I will be suffering the poison condition. The Skeleton Archer's turn is done, it goes to the Shadow Cultus, and and at this point, you are able now to go ahead through the rest of this start here guide, making choices on your own to wrap up this scenario. Beginning the Shadow Cultist turn, we need to go into the rune bag as it states for the special roll and pull a token out. And which rune do we get? A blue one this time, and it is going to be this shape. I'll place the rune right here. I've gone ahead and pulled the darkness tile we need to place, but first let's talk about darkness spawning. Now in a typical scenario, you're going to have icons in different rooms that relate to where darkness actually begins. Now in this start here guide scenario, this one has all the darkness tiles spawning underneath the cultist to start and then moving towards the strongest hero. Whereas in other situations, you're gonna find the darkness being planted on a spawn and then growing towards the strongest hero. So let's head back to focusing on the darkness tile we need to place right now which begins underneath the cultist which is currently in the water but then needs to spread towards Vorn. That's going to be not possible with this current tile. So whenever you have a situation like this, this particular tile then turns into three single individual darkness tiles in order to have the darkness not only spawn under the cultist but also crawl towards the strongest hero. 
So I've gone ahead and placed one of the tiles underneath the cultist, as it mentions in the special rules, as well as it growing towards the strongest hero, in this case has to be Vorn. It heads up here for a single tile right there, and then the third tile can't be placed because, well, there's already darkness adjacent to it already, so this last tile here will just be removed, and that's it. That's as simple as it gets. Now, when we're more out in the open, when I try to come around maybe the side of the darkness and go right at the cultist, that's when things are going to get really interesting because this thing will continue to just keep spawning darkness shooting straight at me which does have impacts not only for damage as I've talked about before but can also mess with my dice results and I will be talking about that if it happens. It's also worth mentioning that after interacting with the interaction point you can remove it from the game. So the cultist is quite happy to stay exactly where he is and make a shot at us from range two squares away. And it's going to be five damage plus one for being right on top of the darkness for a total of six. We are probably going to want to react to this in order to defend against it. All right, so with eight health remaining and I've got poison on me and a bunch of other stuff going on, I definitely want to try and prevent any more damage from getting through. So what I'm gonna do is use my blue cube here to use divert, which allows me to prevent three. So only three is coming through, dropping me down to five. The Shadow Cultist then curses me because some damage got through. So I'm gonna choose to block up this one right here. It's worth noting that you really don't want to collect curse cubes because once you have to place your sixth black one, that means your character is now corrupted and the adventure immediately fails. The good news is if you see the word cleanse as a keyword in your actions, you can use the cleanse ability to allow you to take away curse cubes. We're back to Vorn, and at this point, Poison is going to trigger as a condition, which is going to hit us for one damage, dropping us from five down to four. We're really going to need to think about shielding up or healing along the way here, as that seems to be the only way we're going to be able to escape this. So Vorn is going to go ahead and use his move action. He's going to move from where he currently is, one, two, and three. I'm going to sit right here. The reason I want to be here rather than in either of the other options around this skeleton archer is mainly because of darkness that's going to be coming from the cultist. I want to stay at least more than three spaces away from that to not have to deal with any negatives from that condition. Now, what we're going to do next here is we're going to make some attacks. I have two yellow cubes, and I plan on using both of them to just completely annihilate this skeleton archer. All right, now, after thinking about all the different options I have, I'm pretty happy to stick with just wiping the skeleton archer out. So let's go ahead and activate the first uh, action cube ability here for arcing swing. This is a cleave too. Unfortunately, I'm not able to target two individuals as I'm not close enough right yet, but that's okay. We're getting a plus three to the hit, so that's nice. We're going to go ahead and roll our die. We're looking for a seven or higher and we've got three already let's see how this goes 17 that is going to be more than enough now something else that i haven't talked about to this point is right here tactical advantage whenever you roll 16 plus you get to self shield for two so we did go way over 16 so we're going to be gaining two shields as well as that successful attack against the skeleton archer now it's important to note that you can get a natural 20 of course on a d20 and if you do it's considered a critical hit which can do some serious serious damage but as you can see here I rolled a 17 plus a 3 to my hit which makes 20 but it's not a natural 20. Three damage is going through to the skeleton archer bringing it from six down to three halfway. The next action cube I'm going to use is this yellow one right here for guarding strike a shield two so we'll be getting two additional shields for a total of four plus two to my hit and a plus one damage so my damage will go from three to four i still have to roll this off i've got two already i need a seven or higher let's see how it goes 19 wow okay so that is going to do it that'll be more than enough damage to take out the skeleton archer the archer has been taken out i'll remove the miniature as well as the cube on the health track for the monster plus the initiative card now we're also going to be pushed into an unwilling recall action here in a second, but I want to talk about all the shield tokens I have now. So first off, I got two shield tokens because the first roll was above 16. The second roll was also above 16 and one of my abilities gave us two shields. So we have a total of six now. At this point, I'm going to choose to place a curse cube based on my unwilling recall action down here for whirlwind of steel. Now we have a total of four. Remember, six is bad news. 
It's now time for the Shadow Cultist to go. Let's go ahead to the rune bag and pull a rune, find out what darkness tile is coming from the cultist. We have ourselves the gray rune, which looks like this is an L-shaped piece. Looking at the game board, this L-shaped piece is not going to work for moving from the cultist and out towards our hero. It's just not going to fit on the game board. So we need to exchange this in for three single pieces and we'll place them now. So as you can see, positioning is everything. I'm really glad that I placed Vorn in the position that he's in so the darkness doesn't affect him just yet. The Shadow Cultist is throwing five damage at us plus the one for being on darkness, which is a total of six. I wanna make a correction right now. I had six shield tokens here as I talked about from before, but the maximum you can have is four. So I've dropped that back down. So with six damage coming at me from the Shadow Cultist, I can use and will use as you're supposed to use all your shield tokens a second you're able to use them and that's going to drop it to two damage coming through and now the question is do i want to let that two damage come through but it also comes through with a curse or do i want to try to prevent it which is likely a good idea in order to stop the curse from coming through and i think i want to stop the cursing as i've got four of them already so i'm going to go ahead and grab this blue one here actually you know what let's grab the green one seeing as green has been all locked up and we'll place it on the plate armor which is going to prevent three Three. We only needed to prevent two, so everything is fine here. We blocked the Shadow Cultist attack fully, and that's going to resolve its turn. Starting things out with Vorn, Vorn does have a poison token on him, and until I cleanse, it's going to continue to hit my HP by one at the beginning of my turn. So based on the current setup of things, I could go ahead with my movement and jump right down into the water. Now I'm gonna lose some movement by doing that. It wouldn't get me close enough and I'd probably have to burn a bunch of cubes just to get within melee attack range. Plus the fact that darkness has another con for me. If I'm adjacent to it when I'm making a melee attack, when I'm rolling my die, I get a negative two to my hit roll. That's not good. So what I think I'm gonna do instead, seeing as the darkness is creeping in my direction already, is I'm actually gonna take a step back to the top left hand corner we're going to run away from the cultist and actually have the cultist run through the darkness itself and get a little closer to me and then with a lot more open terrain and a lot less darkness maybe make a line towards it on the following round plus it'll give me some time to heal up maybe get rid of my poison condition and also get my health back up seeing his at three right now so Vorn has backed up into the corner and now I've got two action cubes to spend. So let's choose these actions wisely. So looking at my current state, I've got four curse cubes. That's not good. I'm poison, which is slowly trickling away my health and I'm very low on health. I need to deal with all of this. So one thing you can use is cleanse. It's definitely something that'll help you. A cleanse ones, for instance, will allow you to take away one of these curse cubes and also remove a poison condition at the same time. So a very worthwhile thing to do. So this one up here for defender one says remove a curse heal two and cleanse one that sounds pretty good i have no intention of using this red cube so i'm going to go ahead and place this red cube up here that is going to allow me to heal up to five and when you cleanse one i can choose one of these to remove the actual poison token will also disappear I've chosen to go ahead and remove the curse from Bull Rush. This will give me the ability to move a bunch as well as to do some straight damage with a spell attack. That's pretty nice. Now I have one more cube to spend, but I'm thinking about doing a willing recall action. And you can do a willing recall action when you have two different colors of cubes left or less. So in this case, I have yellow and blue. So at this point, I could do this. It would immediately end my turn, but I wouldn't have to take a curse in order to bring all of my other cubes back to the center. However, I do want to shield up so that my heal wasn't a complete waste. So I think I'll spend the yellow cube that was in here. I want to place this on join the fray, and that is going to give me a shield too. It does give me the ability to move and a zero to hit but that's not going to be of any concern to me right now. I really want to make sure that we have shields ready to go for the cultist attack. Vorn's turn is now done. We're going to move this token to the Shadow Cultist and immediately go ahead and spawn some darkness underneath of the Cultist. Let's see what tile we're going to get. And the rune, we have this rune here and this is the tile. 
Here is the shape that we now need to place. It is going to basically be orthogonally adjacent to the darkness piece that is closest to my hero. That's where it's going to start moving out from. And why is this? Because these darkness pieces are said to be coming from right underneath of the cultist. But the cultist already has some darkness underneath of it. So because of this, we're going to find the one that's closest to my hero, which is this one right here. And we can place this a number of different ways. It could go like this and be valid placement. It could be like this and be a valid placement but we get to choose when there's multiple different selections we could also even flip it around this way and this would be considered valid as well there's probably some other variations but whatever will bring the darkness the tile you're placing down the closest to the strongest hero is a valid move so i can do this strategically and go like this and i'm going to place it in this fashion so that i have the availability to still run past all the darkness to get right to the cultist when it makes its move up to me now at this point, I realized that my strategy has a little bit failed, and I was thinking more likely along the lines of the Skeleton Archer and its range 1. I had forgotten the Cultist range is 2, so it can still hit me without even moving. So me stepping back as far as I did was not a good strategy to actually throw at the Cultist here, because he doesn't even have to move and he's able to still attack me. I now have more ground to cover to get caught back up with the Cultist and make any type of melee attack. This could make things a little bit tougher on me. So this is going to be a little bit brutal, but we have six damage coming through. As we know, the cultist is on top of darkness, so five plus one is six. We have two shield tokens to use here, so we'll remove those. That'll bring it down to four. I'm definitely going to go ahead and use this blue cube here in order to do a reaction to prevent three. So that's a total of five prevented, but one will still get through, which will knock us down to four, and a curse is coming along with that. I'm going to choose to place my curse token right here on the passive ability. It's kind of unfortunate, and really, this mistake, by me backing up into the corner is really going to cost me because I need to move a lot to get within range to make any kind of attack now. So it's back to Vorn's turn at this point, and honestly, I'm not going to be able to get all the way to the Shadow Cultist without also trying to ensure I don't get beat up too badly. I'm going to probably have to do a mix of both, do some healing, do some cleansing, that kind of thing. I'm probably going to have to go ahead, well, after I spend my first cube, the only one that I have left here, it's going to force me into an unwilling recall action, which I may not want to have happen, as that will place another curse and bump me up to a total of five curses, which I ugh, that puts me into a really, really sketchy situation so maybe what I'll end up doing is doing a willing recall during my turn here in order to bring my cues back to avoid that extra curse. I still feel pretty silly about missing the fact that Shadow Cultists could hit me from two range because that's certainly going to cause me harm and chances of success now have probably gone down but one two and three so my regular move action will bring me to there which is not far enough but at this point I can work on trying to move a little bit more if I want to. I think I'm in big trouble here, big, big trouble. The more I look at this, the harder this looks to me to actually win at this point. So from what I can see here, if I was to go ahead right now and spend this yellow cube on one of these things, like I could do the uh, guarding strike here, which allows me to bump up my shields by two and I obviously wouldn't be able to take advantage of the melee attack and the hit damage because I'm not close enough. But there is a semicolon in between the shield and the two hit. So my understanding is that I could get the two shields, which could help me with the six attack that's going to be coming to me next which is more than enough to wipe me out now if i had those two shields as well as uh, the ability to prevent three on one of these different cubes down here that would be only a one hit overall but another curse would be coming my way so where my head's going with this is if i allow myself to have an un uh, willing recall action right now. In other words, if I spend this to get the two shields, it will force a curse into one of these slots, giving me a total of five. And then when I'm done my turn, no matter what I do, it shifts over to the Shadow Cultist. I still won't be able to fully block the attack. And that sixth curse will land on my individual here, the hero, and he will be taken out. And that is probably the way this is going to go now, seeing as I ran away from the fight rather than going towards it, as I've kind of cut my time down that I had. So you can see a lot of this really does come down to how you use your abilities which ones you populate with curses and so on but the other option i have here is to do a willing recall action just end my turn completely um, and then at that point i'm not taking the one curse extra right now and so i only have one curse coming to me on the next attack from the shadow cultist which will keep me alive for just a little bit longer and actually as i say that and i think that through it's not really going to help me because i'm currently at four health right now now the 
problem I'm having here is with six damage coming through, if I go ahead and take a willing recall action, all my cubes come into the center, which is great, but my turn immediately ends. I don't have any shield defense, which means when a six comes my way, I can prevent at most three. I'm currently at four, which would keep me alive with one HP. So that really does seem to be the only way out at this point. So I've taken my willing recall action. All the cubes are back in the middle. I'm ending my turn right here and we head over to the Shadow Cultist. This is looking more and more grim. I really don't think I'm gonna be able to get through 10 HP and keep my individual alive here. It's gonna be super tough. Uh, we got this one coming out for the darkness next. So that's gonna be this gigantic piece right here, which uh, based on where I'm currently sitting is definitely gonna be broken into three pieces. So this is going to be a pretty easy add for the cultists. So basically coming out from the cultists here to here, and another one is going to show up here because it has to be orthogonally adjacent when you attach them, and then up to this area right here where I'm currently standing. So the darkness has fallen and is sitting right underneath of Vorn right now, but I do have one trick up my sleeve here in a second, which I'll talk about. But for right now, the Shadow Cultist is going to make its attack. It's coming at me with six damage. I'm gonna go ahead and use this red cube right here in order to use the plate armor and prevent three of it. So three is still coming through. That's the best I can currently do, dropping me down to one right on death's door. Now this is where things get interesting. So the turn is gonna go back over to me and the first thing I'm gonna do and what would happen normally is because I'm standing and captured now into the darkness as it's right underneath of Vorn, at this point I would take two damage from the darkness. However, as a minor action on my turn, because remember I got an amulet from that girl earlier on that stated during my turn at any point in time in the turn I can go ahead and destroy two darkness away so I'm gonna go ahead and remove the darkness tile that's underneath of me and the one that landed right here on this corner in order to free up some space to make a run at the cultist so I do have to place another curse cube because on the shadow cultist last turn damage got through dropping me from four down to one and I just didn't place the curse cube at that time no game play impact but should have been done at that moment i'm gonna go ahead and place this black cube right here blocking up my agility ability so now knowing that i don't need to deal with any darkness hits and i'm in the clear i'm gonna make my move action i'm gonna send vorn much closer he will be losing one point of movement as he moves into the water but all he's gonna need well he's gonna need all three in order to get right up adjacent all right now we have to balance things really well here because not only do i need to try and make an attack here i also need to make sure i shield up and i'm prepared to take any hits i only have one health left and i can only spend two cubes during this turn so let's see if we can get ourselves out of a jam here. Now, the one I'm looking at here for Defender 1 says, remove a curse, I can heal two and cleanse one. That sounds like the best thing to do right now. And then maybe after that, what I'll do is focus on doing an attack here, like this one here would give me two shields plus an additional damage. So two shields on top of a heal two would give me enough of a buffer that I'd be able to take on an attack as well as trying to prevent three later on so that I don't die. I might last another round, in other words. And I'm kind of thinking in advance, and you have to do this, you have to strategize turns down the line because things are going to change every single time that turn order initiative token changes positions. So I'm gonna go ahead and use one yellow right here. So it's gonna allow me to heal back up to three. I don't have any poison to get rid of. Uh, that's gonna happen when I use the cleanse one. I also get to get rid of one of these curse cubes and this choice is really important. Now there's two things running through my mind right now. There is the chance if I got rid of this curse cube here that when I do my yellow roll in a second for an attack as my second cube, that I could get some shields out of it. And there's a chance that I could work out. It has to be on the roll though, nothing additional added into it. So that's risky. It may not work out for me, but what is guaranteed instead is if I actually go ahead and remove this one, it gives me the ability to move, but also be able to heal, which is something I probably need to be basically make up time for my mistake earlier on. So let's try and do that we'll leave first aid open and now with that all sorted let's go ahead and make an attack so i'm going to use my other yellow cube here and i want to make sure i use the one that's going to help me out the most so the guarding strike gives me two shields a plus two on the hit and an additional damage that sounds very useful so the two shields have been placed on we get a plus two to this roll and an extra damage so we're going in with four damage so long as we get our accuracy rating of seven or higher here's hoping that pans out first 19 ah worst and i had actually kept the curse here so i don't get the extra shields didn't know 
know if that was going to work out, but guess what? It did. That's kind of funny. Uh, but regardless, we still got our hit through, which is great. So a total of four damage going against the cultist. So finally some damage dropping from a 10 down to a six. We do have hope. Very, very small hope, but we got some. Turn order token has now moved to the shadow cultist. Let's go ahead and draw from the bag here. See what we get. And it's a green token this time, a straight line. We'll put the rune right here. This gets a bit stressful. So at this particular point, I think we're not gonna be able to stop the barrage that is coming at us. And my move is finally catching up with me, the one where I backpedaled into the corner. Cause at this point now, we're gonna be growing out from a shadow position that's closest to the strongest hero. So this long shadow is going to come out straight across here, but it can't fit. So it's gonna be broken from the long four, which it was to three singles and it's going to grow out from the darkness and it does state that it's going to grow adjacent to the uh, darkness that exists already if the shadow cultist is standing on darkness so this just basically continues out but the rest won't be actually placed because it's already going to hit the strongest hero and there's nobody else no other heroes for the rest of the darkness to branch out to so at this point these ones can go away we're now standing on darkness again, which is not good for us. Now, one thing I want to mention, everyone, is that on my last roll, when it was Vorn's turn, I got a 19. I didn't mention anything about the minus two to hit for being adjacent to darkness because it was a moot point as I was getting a plus two to hit straight from the ability already. So it really just stayed at 19. I just wanted to clarify that for those that had noticed it. So as of this point right now, these two characters, because they're adjacent to each other, considered to be engaged. And when a monster is ready to make its attack, if it's a ranged monster, Monster, it is going to try to separate or disengage so in this point it's going to go ahead and use its movement which it has up to four of to move to a position that is still within its range to make a shot but just no longer engaged so from this position now it's going to make an attack with five damage plus the one for being adjacent to darkness and it's going to be a total of six so two shields will take care of the first two. That leaves four left. I'll go ahead and use this blue one here to divert as a reaction for preventing three. So one will get through. This will drop me from three down to two, which means a curse is coming. I'm gonna go ahead and put the curse in the first aid ability. We're still standing, but not for long. Here's where the rubber meets the road, and I am definitely going down right now. I'm starting my turn off for Vorn. I'm in the darkness, and as we know, during our turn, darkness can only hit us for two damage only one time. No matter whether we started in darkness, run through darkness later on, it's only going to hit us for two. So right now, I've got to take that two damage, but it is preventable. I can try to actually uh, block it away. So what I can do, and this is going to actually end it regardless, is why I said I'm kind of trapped. This green one here, if I went ahead and used Divert as a reaction to prevent three which would stop the two damage from getting through i've now gone ahead and burnt all of my cubes which would then force me into an unwilling recall action which will put an additional curse on my board and that will push me up to six which is going to ko vorn so Vorn has fallen, the dwarf is out, and it is worth talking about at this point in time with the tutorial now over, and of course I'll be redoing this outside of the camera. Really hope all the aspects of the learning that I've gone over here from the start guide has also helped you to get a better understanding of how this game operates, but I highly recommend after going through that start here guide as well as this video, also going ahead and reading through the rule book at this point, because now you'll have a better appreciation of the intricacies and the other layers of the rule as they apply to your playthroughs. Now, it's worth mentioning here, if I had been successful, rewards would have been a thing, as well as the camp phase, which is, again, another piece of this. There's more to the puzzle than just what you've seen here in terms of the campaign. So for rewards, if things had gone positively, we would have been able to reveal all cards from the level one equipment deck. Each player could then choose an equipment card, and then all leftover cards would now form the previous camp items deck. And that camp phase would be going on as well plus a whole bunch of narrative but without spoiling all of that and leaving some mystery around this at the beginning i'm going to leave it at this particular point really hope this video helped you understand how the game flows and operates definitely be on the lookout for the campaign which is coming very very soon and all details will be in the pin comment and the video description thank you guys so much for watching and as always keep on rolling solo